This program was made possible by production support from the Greater Montana Foundation. Well, it's beautiful with spacious skies, has amber waves of green, and has purple mountains majestic that rise up out of the plains. And all across America, from sea to shining sea, where the mountains and the prairies meet is a place I need to be. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to... Hello, I'm William Marcus. Welcome to the Backroads of Montana, a special series that chronicles the interesting people and remote locations that make Montana so unique. Today we're at the Heritage Art Gallery in Lolo, and like the art here, today's show has a traditional western theme. In true cowboy fashion, we'll spend most of the time on the open range, on ranches or in the small communities that typify Montana's rural environment. We'll take a hot air balloon ride over Montana's cowboy capital, Miles City, try on a great fitting pair of custom made cowboy boots in Lockwood. We'll spend the day in Ingemar, a town of only 12 residents, and we'll learn the difference between pictographs and petroglyphs on brief excursions to Pompey's Pillar and the pictograph caves near Billings. We'll start in western Montana amid the thundering hooves of over 250 quarter horses. We joined a two-day drive with rancher Carl Moss through the spectacular beauty of the Mission Mountains. You have to be really careful because uh, they have a tendency that once the leader starts, if they, you know, if you just let them go, they, they want to go fast and then they get to crowding each other and that's when you'll get a lot of injuries or get the fence tore down or things like that. So that's why we was real cautious at each of the gates to keep them stopped until, you know, all the horses got through because uh, they have a tendency to really rush it when you do let them start. Yep. No, 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 no. That old girl's going to try to go over the fence next time around, Carl. The key to, to driving horses is that you, you've got to be out thinking them. You can't out outmaneuver them if you're not a step ahead of them. If you're a step behind them, you're, you're beat every time. Of course, these horses, uh, you know, the, the breeding and stuff that's in them, they're, they're uh, there's just no quit to them, you know, they just uh, will go for, you, you just can't ride enough to take it out of them. they got amazing minds on them and they're trainable and they can athletic and, you know, and, you know that, that, that is the quality of the quarter horses, it's versatility. Hey, they're, uh, these are all registered quarter horses and, uh, uh, we, we've, uh, we started breeding them, uh, it's been about 25 years ago now that we started with these, uh, with this line and we've bred for the speed, but yet, you know, working using horses and, uh, endurance, uh, boy, they, they've got to be tough and they're raised in, in tough conditions. They're raised right out in the hills year round. We don't even, you know, uh, you know, uh, well, that's one thing about these horses, they're not pampered horses. They know how to take care of themselves. And that makes better horses out of them. Well, I, I can think of one old horse that I grew up on. I've had him one time, uh, I was chasing some horses and uh, he, uh, he got out from under me. He turned real quick when I wasn't expecting it and I fell off and, and he actually stopped and waited until I got back on before he followed those horses. And, so you mean, there can be some real bonds, you know. You know, it's just, it's, it's really neat. You know, they're, they're neat animals that, you know, they're, they're just something about that uh, uncontained energy and the sounds and, you know. I've had, uh, you know, so many pictures in my mind of these things that, 
you wished you were hanging them on the wall, but they're just in your mind. But, you know, a lot of things even better than what we did today with them. You know, it's just amazing to see them. And it's, uh, no, it's just something that, uh, you know, is part of your life, and it'll never, never be any different than that. Sadly, this is a last of sorts, the last drive on land that Carl Moss loves. He sold the family ranch and hopes to relocate in eastern Montana. We're sure that his memories of this ranch will be as fine as the quarter horses his family's raised for 40 years. For the working rancher or horseman, there are few things more important than a good pair of boots. They last through spring muck and summer sweat and still take a good shine when you need to look your best. Our next story is about a man who couldn't find a good pair of cowboy boots to buy when he changed out of his uniform after World War II, so he decided to make his own. And over the past 35 years, he's built a reputation as Montana's king of custom boot making. Most of the customers who stop in at Mike Ives' custom boot shop in Lockwood are ranchers or ranch hands, people who wear boots on the job every day. They come to Mike Ives because they know they'll get sturdy, no-nonsense boots made by a man who knows his craft inside and out. When you look at a boot, when it's finished, it looks like a pretty simple thing, right? But to get everything to go together and still have something that looks good, then you're playing in a different ballpark. Ives taught himself to make boots by tearing down an old pair and putting them back together. He learned to take measurements and shape the special forms called lasts to ensure a proper fit. The leather has to be stretched over the last with just the right tension. At the height of his business, Mike Ives made 200 pair of boots a year. He makes half that many now. Ives says it takes about 16 hours to produce a pair of boots, and he likes to keep five or six pair going at a time. The starting price is $275. Extra stitching, exotic leathers, and taller tops cost more. Although the price is about the same as factory-made boots, Ives says his boots are not for everyone. Anybody that likes something a little better, a little extra, that's what makes the enjoyment out of doing it. And Ives is particular about the kind of person he likes to see wearing his boots. Yeah, I'd rather be making boots for somebody who's making their living in them. I'm not saying uh, better class of people, but they're an easier class of people to please. A lot of my old customers, they just come in, make me a pair of boots, and that's it. I'm making boots. Many of those regular customers ask for a calfskin boot, but Ives has dozens of rolls of different leathers including elephant hide, ostrich, lizard, camel, kid skin, and tough bull hide. The import of some of the exotic leathers is strictly controlled. The elephant hide comes from Zimbabwe, where thriving elephant populations are controlled with hunting. Ive says that once he knows what his customer wants, he picks out the leather himself. He relies on his years of experience when choosing the right materials. I can take a hold of a piece of leather and know that's good or not. Heck. 25 years ago, I never seen a pair of elephant boots. Never even heard of it. But now, everybody wants them. Mike Ives passes on his knowledge of leathers and his boot making skills to a few students every year. He says if they have talent, he can teach them the basics in about 10 days. They're not gonna make as nice and as pretty a boot as I make, but they can make a boot, pair of boots if they, you know, take notes and one thing and another. They could, they can go out of here in 10 days and able to make boots. But practice is the only thing that makes it good. Mike Ives says he can tell a good handmade boot with just a quick glance. His boots carry several of his own trademarks, like the design on the toe called a bug. It's a signature of sorts. And Ives has designed over 100 stitching patterns and sews them himself. The sole of each boot is held together with about 100 tiny wooden pegs. They're inserted at opposing angles to ensure a tight grip. And the pegs is drove, like this row, first row here is drove in this way. Then this next row of pegs is drove in this way, so that locks your 
your soul on there like that. And it'll, it never comes loose. And, and then this part around here is just sewn. That's sewed, yeah. The hammer Ives is using is another example of his handiwork. Well, he fashioned he it out of a truck spring. In fact, Ives made all the tools that litter his workbench. <laughs> Mike Ives, who admits to being over 70, enjoys working at his own pace. He says that a pair of boots ordered today will be delivered in about six months. And other than his dog, Tack, who prizes the leather scraps that litter the shop floor, Ives enjoys working alone. If I was downtown, it'd be people standing around and visiting all the time, you know, and hey, you can talk yourself right out the door. Ives says when a pair of boots leaves his shop, they shouldn't have to be broken in. They should fit perfectly the first time you put them on. And even though a fancy pair of dress boots will eventually get roughed up, they'll do the job for a very long time. <laughs> I got more boots than I'll ever live long enough to wear out. Mike Ives does his best to wear out those boots as an active horseman. The day before our visit, he was in a roping contest and won first place. Not far from Mike's shop are the pictograph caves of the Yellowstone Valley. Once the home of Stone Age hunters, these caves provided food, shelter, and acted as a canvas for early artists. They used berries, animal fat, and charcoal to record pictures of meaningful events and spiritual beliefs. The area is abundant in wildflowers and alive with bees and birdsong. Ever since the caves were excavated in the late 1930s, they've fallen victim to repeated vandalism. Artifacts were stolen, shot at, the museum was even burned. Days before our arrival, a group spray painted one of the cave walls. It's disheartening to witness such disregard for a visual link to our ancient history. Well, let's lift our spirits and travel to Miles City for the fourth annual balloon roundup with pilot Ed Chabot. Miles City is a nice, nice town to fly in for several reasons. The, the 
people in the community back the balloon rally wholeheartedly. Uh, everybody comes out for the rally. Everybody's happy to see us. Uh, we have a good time when we're here, the, the pilots do. We had 30 balloons this year. We have them from as far away as Houston, Texas, Anchorage, Alaska. Uh, we have them from California, Nebraska, Wisconsin, North and South Dakota, Montana, Colorado. Quite a variety of places, really. The balloonists are thrilled to come. In fact, we have some that have come back every year because they say that we're so excited about them. You know, they say when they go to the great big rallies that people go, oh, there go the balloons again. Well, <laughs> it's such a novel for us that people really do enjoy them. I've always enjoyed balloon rallies and went to a lot of them, uh, uh, particularly down in Billings. Uh, went out and went for a ride, I fell in love, and two months later I owned a balloon. Uh, I'm working on my third balloon now. Year-wise, it doesn't matter how much a pilot flies, the, the question, the important question is how many hours a pilot has in a balloon. I've got over 400 hours, which is uh, getting to be a pretty good amount of hours. There are pilots here that when they logged in, they logged in with uh, over a thousand hours of flight time. There are other pilots that are coming with 30, 35 hours of flight time. And the more time I feel, the more time a person has. In the air, the safer they are. Taking more time talking than flying. <laughs> there are a lot of open fields, places to land, no matter whether we're in town or out on the edges of town or out the, in the countryside, there's, there's good landing spots, and that's what balloon pilots really enjoy. Uh, and we've yet to find a place where people don't want us to come down and land, and that's always nice. Uh, we, we like to have lots of good landing spots so that we can pick the one we want. We're going to hit and we're going to bounce. Here comes the ground, boom, back up, down, and we should be nice stay on the back side of us, don't get in front of the balloon. All right, hang on to it. Hopefully a lot of, of fun, basically. We try to keep it a family event, you know, where people can really get to know this sport, which is basically non-existent in southeastern Montana, and bring a little business in and the change of pace for a hot, dry summer. Had our balloon drifted about 120 miles to the southwest, we would have landed at Pompey's Pillar, a remarkable rock rising 200 feet above the Yellowstone River. In 1806, Captain William Clark stood on its summit and observed vast herds of buffalo and elk. On a stone cliff beneath ancient petroglyphs, he scratched his name. This famous signature is the only physical evidence in Montana of the historic Lewis and Clark expedition. all the white man graffiti, all of that. And, and you realize that there's lots of stuff going on underneath it all. Now let's move back to the east and north. About 40 miles north of Forsyth is a community of roughly a dozen people. One of its citizens described the area as being full of snow, mud, bugs, and dust. 
but he was quick to add that he wouldn't live anywhere else. Ingemar, Montana is known for its sheep, its free land, its wide open spaces, but mostly for its beans. Well, I am sure it's my beans, my Jersey Louis beans. That's... The man with the curious appetizers is Bill Seward, chef, bartender, historian, unofficial mayor, and oldest citizen of this small eastern Montana town. Ingemar is barely noticeable, isolated on the alkali flats between the Yellowstone and Missouri rivers. Most folks pass right by, but those who do pull off Highway 12 and onto Ingemar's spacious gravel streets soon discover that there is more to this town than a vague promise of homespun hospitality. Usually, Bill is the first to greet visitors, he and any number of dogs who inhabit the wooden boardwalk lining the town's business district. If I can visit with him, why, that's where you get to know people is talk to them, and if you don't talk, you don't, you get to where you can't hear if you don't talk, you know. What you're likely to hear about is Bill's most obvious invention, it's that string on his head. This practical device keeps his glasses suspended above his nose. Just take them from off my nose, and I don't drop them on the floor, and I don't make saddle sores on my nose, and don't hurt my ears. So if I could go back and kiss them old horses I used to have to put an ear bridle on and make them wear, well, I'd, I'd do it, and I'd apologize. <laughs> I know now why they fought an ear bridle so hard. Since 1958, Bill has operated the Jersey Lily, a local saloon, cafe, and general gathering place for area residents. The specialty of the house is internationally known, the Jersey Lily beans, served piping hot, still in the saucepan. I've knew about this ever since I was born. <laughs> They're very, very good. Of course, I make good beans, too. <laughs> the beans are so famous that even the mounted remains of two antelope locked in eternal combat isn't enough to spoil the appetite of most folks. Bill keeps the Jersey Lily looking much like it did when his father owned it in the 1940s. Its rustic charm evolved out of necessity. Bill claims that when old things break, he can fix them. With newer appliances, he's at a loss. As a result, the Jersey Lily's rugged appearance has been exploited numerous times in national advertisements. The fact that it was named in honor of Judge Roy Bean's bar in Langtree, Texas, hasn't hurt much either. Originally, the building was the town bank. In 1921, its president misappropriated the funds. The bank went into receivership, closed, and eventually became the town saloon, some relief to the citizens whose money was never returned. Today, beer chills in the old safe, and steaks are grilled in one of the rear vaults. It's an atmosphere in here that you can bring your wife or your kid or your girlfriend or your mother or your dad or a preacher or anybody else in here, and. Uh, I don't think any of them have their feelings uh, hurt or insulted or... Ingemar hasn't always been 12 people and two businesses. It began life as one of the largest sheep shearing and wool shipping posts in North America. Two million pounds of wool were shipped from here during its peak years. The business was so efficient that shearing pens in Perth, Australia were designed using the pens in Ingemar as a model. The area boomed, boasting 50 businesses, doctors, dentists, and a land office with 2,500 homestead filings each year. Water, the town's scarcest resource, arrived on the same train that shipped out the wool. The Milwaukee Railroad left behind their 22,000-gallon water tender when the service was discontinued. But in this parched environment, prosperity dried as quickly as laundry in a hot breeze. Cattlemen with their great herds pushed the sheep herders out of business. Eventually, they were displaced by the homesteaders and the end of the open range. Rain, crops, and homesteaders vanished simultaneously. The final blow occurred in 1921. A devastating fire destroyed almost every business in town. But this desolate landscape held a strange grip on hardier citizens. Bill returned after a successful career as a professional lightweight boxer and took over his father's duties at the Jersey Lily. Lee Cool flew into town 35 years ago, tied his small plane to a fence post, and never left. Friends come out from the east and people to visit me, and uh, I tell them this is just the right size town. 
gets any bigger, I'll move down to Sumatra. There's only one family there. <laughs> Janet Micey resurrected the area's wool industry, opening a small sweater shop at the end of the boardwalk. She and other residents collected and published the town's history. People around here are very fond of this area. No crowds, no traffic. It's a very nice place to live. We hope that it, it will survive somehow. Through the Jersey Lily, um, our shop, uh, it's, it's really a necessary thing to have, a, a community. This community is surviving, despite its past hardships and its uncertain future. Bill's philosophy of keeping things running by keeping them simple might also be the secret of Ingemar's longevity. Honesty, tenacity, simplicity, all describe this town and its residents, as changeless as the surrounding prairie that is so close to one man's heart. That space, there's no trees, there's no rivers, there's no rocks, there's no clouds. It's space. There's a photograph of the Jersey Lily Bar and Cafe in the book Montana Spaces. It also contains Bill Seward's favorite quote, it's by Glenn Law. Montana's special gift is space, landscape made personal. Space that reaches out to the horizon, then comes back and gets under your skin. It reaches inward, wraps itself around your soul, incubates, and grows. When you finally begin to understand just what it is about Montana that is important to you, it has already taken root in your heart, and you'll never be the same. When we were leaving Ingemar, Bill Seward asked where we were headed. We said, Mile City. He said, have a good time, and gave us $5 to help that happen. He signed it, Compliments of the Jersey Lily, Bill Seward which makes it worth more than $5 to us. Well, that's our show. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Backroads of Montana. If you missed the first three programs in this series, we're happy to say they're available at your city county library, free to check out and enjoy, as long as you have no overdue fines. If you have any questions or comments about our series, write to us at this address. Backroads of Montana, University of Montana, Missoula, Montana, 59812. As long as you keep watching, we'll keep covering the back roads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. See you next time. And it's a land of many waters coming down from mountains high. And there's a mighty big sky up above us here. You can hear them coyotes crying. And there's plenty of room for moving and plenty of fresh air. And the folks out here have the time of day and a helping hand to share. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes, I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Coming in off the road now, boys, you know I'm heading home.